Yeah. Lifestyle of the rich and psychotic. He wasn't strong enough, so he got wasted. That's all. He couldn't hack it, so he got nailed. Period. Ain't gonna dream no more, no more. Ain't gonna dream no more. Yo, I thought I heard voices. <laughs> Kim Kate, I could kiss you. What's stopping you? Mm. Yo, Freddy! Where you hiding at, you burnt face pussy? Hey, we should find the others first. You think you're hot shit with the little milk kid, don't you? Well, let me see you come get a piece of me. Kruger, pussy! This is it. Are you ready? You snuffed the sucker. Joining us today, a man that wears many hats. He's an actor, a writer, producer, director. He played many roles, but horror fans, you know him as King Cade in Nightmare on Elm Street 3 and 4. Please welcome today on Horror 365, Mr. Ken Sagos. Ken, thank you for joining us today, buddy. Can I say fucking A? (laughs) Yes, sir. Whatever you want. (laughs) Too late to say, can I say it now, right? <laughs> <laughs> Fucking A, there it goes, Ken. Four letter words are going to be flying, folks. You hear it? <laughs> now, listen, I know you don't like me, you know, calling you Mr. Sago, so we're going to keep it Ken. Uh, I want to start from the beginning. As a young man, Stockbridge, uh, Georgia, I believe you were born and then raised in Atlanta. What yeah. was the vision? Was it always acting? Was it writing? You know, we was a very poor family, so he was always trying to get something to eat. But, <laughs> um, I don't know if it was acting, but I do know my first time doing something on stage was when I was in the uh, second grade that we had, it was called pantomiming. And that's where we was pretending to be singers. So I always got to pretend I was one of the temptations and I had to pretend I was Marvin Gaye. Now I can't sing a lick. God didn't give me that. I, I was about to ask you. So God did not give me a voice and he has made it very clear when I try to sing. <laughs> <laughs> Nice for the joke. My mom told me one time, she said, when I pass, and if you sure don't know if I'm dead or not, sing. If I don't wake up, I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. Well, Ken, I'll tell you right now, um, again, you know, you do it all. You know, writer, like I said, producer, director. We're going to get into some things that you have going on. Uh, I was looking at the, the IMDb page. And I noticed you had wrote 14 plays. And over 35 screenplays? I mean, yes. that's that's incredible, Ken. I mean... I think what it was, Jim, is that I never got into drugs. I never got into any of those things. I always was a creative person. So when I wasn't working or not working, I'm writing. I'm creating. And so, and I would, you know, I, I don't know if you know, but I am a former staff writer for Paramount. Yep. And so, um... So I was, I'm always writing. So after you write, you put things up and you write and you put things up. And over the years, I met a lot of the old legends that passed on. I happened to come out in Hollywood when it was still some of those old iconic legends still around who took time to talk to them. Like what are, what are some of the names? Lucille Ball, mm. Marlon Brando. I met Alfred Hitchcock. Oh, wow. Um, and it was because I was working at Universal Studios and I could not afford to um, pay for classes. So um, a friend of mine got me a job at Universal Studios as a security guard, but I was a walking security guard, which mean I had to go from stage to stage to hit a key to make sure I was doing my round. So um, I always made sure that I was in a stage that they was filming because once they start filming, you couldn't move. So I made sure I was always locked in a stage that they was filming so I could watch people act. And 
and that was down the time when it was Quincy Jack Cluckman, and he talked to me, and he knew I was out here. I didn't really have much money, so he made sure that the caterer would leave me a plate of food every day, Jack Cluckman. And wow. And there was Telly Savalas who let me take his workshop free. And I also studied with the great, great Marlon Brando. Wow. And this is why I love uh, talking to the actors, you know, from your generation, because they have such great old Hollywood stories. Like, I love hearing these stories. Yeah. Um, so how old were you when you wrote your first play? When I wrote my first play? I don't know if it was my first short story. If you okay. Yeah. Okay. I wrote that when I was six years old. It was wow. Six. Six years. You playing with the GI it, Joes, and then it, <laughs> there it is. It, it wasn't all of that. It was just called the little boat that couldn't. And we lived in the country, and you know how you make those little boats with paper. Mm -hmm. And I, it was a creek down there, so I had put it the boat in some water like up there by the lake where the creek started and it disappeared and then about a couple of days later I saw the little boat way down the stream it was on the bank and so it had traveled and I wrote my first story about that what that boat probably had to go through with <laughs> the little fish picking at it and everything so I always say that was my first play the, the little boat we could so when growing up and you're writing these stories, did you like um, have family night and read your stories or did you enact them in like your own play? No, I, I did not. I, uh, I remember one time, you know, um, we used to sit in front of the fireplace and I used to make little funny things. And I remember my sister said, my nickname was Scooter. <laughs> so she, Scooter? How'd you get that name? Scooter. Um, I don't know. I don't, <laughs> you know, and so um, I would just remember her saying, let school sit in front, crack some jokes for us. And so I would tell jokes. I, you know, I didn't know that was funny, but I didn't know that was a profession. I just, it's what I did. How'd Very you come nice. up with some of the concepts like uh, of the plays that you wrote? You just, because you had, it sounded like you had a great imagination. As a child, even now, I mean, some of the work that you're doing is what I'm seeing is phenomenal. But uh, the plays and screenplays, how how did that those ideas come to you? Feelings and life. It's like, you know, not blowing smoke up your mind. But when I first met you, you and I had such an energy. You know, I could see a story there because you on the East Coast, I'm on the West Coast, mm -hmm. and, and probably when you was growing up in my time, you couldn't talk with me. You couldn't relate to me, but there's a story there for me to tell. You know, when you, I met you and you met me, I believe we became friends. So it's wonderful to write the meet between those friends and what it was like and to know, because you came from New York, I believe, somewhere. Yeah. New, York, New York and I came from the country. There's some wonderful, wonderful stories of your upbringing and my upbringing that can come together. And so, and I like to write characters that I don't have to work so hard. And when you know you got a good story yep. that you start writing and the character would possess, possess you and help you write the story. Oh, and I'm a character, Ken. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> yes, you <are>. <laughs> And listen, we can, uh, you talk friends, listen, dinner at Thanksgiving, my house, bring the family. We're good. You don't need to find it there for me because I can I can eat for the family. You don't need to find it. <laughs> it as a joke, but if I'm in the era, I'm knocking on the door. Come on in. Listen, the door's always well as long as you're not not bringing that guy Kruger. You're you're more than welcome. <laughs> are there any particular plays, stories, or screenplays that you are most proud of? Oh wow! Uh, yeah, I I wrote a story. Uh, a lot of my stories are Southern stories, but I, I wrote a story about um, one time this black guy went back to the country and he went fishing 
and he there was an old white man there fishing. And this young black guy was a doctor, and that's what he did. And he started talking to this elderly white man who had a lot of on his heart. And he started confessing to the young black guy. And he told him that he had done things in his life that he was ashamed of. And he was the gr former grand wizard of the KKK. Mm -hmm. And so as they talked, and the white man's heart was so heavy, he said, every year when I got out of the clan, I would send money to one of those scholars, those color colleges. And so he talked about a man that they had killed. It turned out that was that man's young kids. Wow. So, wow. But, Jesus. And then when he talked about the scholarship, that young man was a beneficiary of his money. So he needed forgiveness. Mm -hmm. You know, and I leave it that you don't know whether he forgave the man or not. But okay. he, that story is very personal to me because it's not a true story, mm -hmm. but it comes from true events. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Life, you know, and so and so that's that's what it is. And I think a lot of the stories that I like to tell are grounded. Right. And um I just like stories. I I mm -hmm. I, I I enjoy writing comedy. I enjoy writing fiction. I I mean, I enjoy writing the truth. I just enjoy the creativity of creating. You know, I have a story about birds. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, when you say they just listen to nature, I literally have a story. I wrote a book about it. I think I, uh, I think you helped me with raising the money for the book. Mm -hmm. It's called Native the Great Migration. Yeah. And it's about a sparrow that leads a great migration of different birds. And what I did is I used so many different birds. I used each bird and their flock as different races. Okay. So everybody could read it and not feel guilty. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I, I, oh God. Listen, I got to tell you, Ken, you write a lot of different things. Um, and, and I love it because like you said, it's based on true events and, and things that are going on in the world today. And um, we're going to get into something that you're working on now uh, momentarily. But I want to actually switch gears to horror, the horror genre itself. Like, what was your introduction into uh, the horror community? Birds. Oh, yeah, okay. Birds. That's why when I met uh, Alfred Hitchcock, it was, you know, you thought I was a mute. Cause I <laughs> <laughs> and um, and it, that was the first thing that I watched. And then the second movie I watched was Blackula. Okay. And I used to watch a lot of Vincent Price things that was coming up because there wasn't that many um, movies that black actors was in. And so um, that was kind of like my introduction. And if we fast forward to Nightmare on Elm Street, when I auditioned for Nightmare on Elm Street, I had never seen Nightmare on Elm Street. I didn't even know what Nightmare on Elm Street was. Did you know that the audition was for Nightmare on Elm Street? I knew that. I didn't want to go. And I and I, I had you know, I, I didn't want to go because what they was looking for and how I looked, it was a waste of my time. And I had to go to court that morning and I lost and I had to catch the bus. So when I went into the audition, <laughs> Jim, Brian and Jimmy, when I went into the audition, I had such an attitude because I didn't want to be there. And that made you get the King Kate role because that's they thought I was acting. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is real. This is wow, this that's guy is great. Acting, man. And you know, and that's what got me the role. So when I got home, my agent, this was pre um cell phones and all that, you know, there was an Alton, it was those big old Alton machine that looked like a dressing <laughs> dog, you know? So, <laughs> and I kept, it was about 30 something messages and it was all from my agent. And he would say, Ken, call me, call me, you know, so, and when I finally talked to him, he said, what did you do? And I said, well, I told you, David, I didn't want to go. 
and he said, they love you. <laughs> <laughs> Word to the wise. That doesn't mean you go into every audition with an attitude because it didn't work on the next one. <laughs> 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 While I was doing Nightmare on Elm Street, I was up for um, uh, Roger Rabbit, the voice. Uh, uh, the really? Oh, really? Wow. wow. But I couldn't do it. I couldn't go in on all the audition. And I, again, all the things that I was up for at, at that time, I had no idea the power that they were. I had no idea what I was doing when I did Nightmare on Elm Street. I had no idea I was making history. Um, I almost, you know, a lot of my people tried to get me to turn it down. And I'm not saying I didn't almost do it because I needed the money. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I did not know what Nightmare on Elm Street was. It seemed like everybody knew Nightmare on Elm Street but me. So this is this was like all new to you. This is all new to me. So when I went into the audition, and because he called me at the last minute to go, he basically was not sending me to actually audition for the role. What he was really doing was sending me to meet the casting director so that she had a project coming up that he wanted her to see me for. So he thought maybe if he got me in for this audition, she would see me and say, oh, he can fit something else. So that's why I was upset. So when I went there, you know, I got the role, you know. I, I want to say that I was blessed, I was gifted, and I got the role. You know, Ken, you did get the role, and you did a hell of a job um, yep. in, in three and four. The best in the franchise, I believe, and I think many can agree. I also have to say number three and number four has made technically the most money mm -hmm. out of all of them. I'm not bragging that I was in those two, but they have made the most money. Well, you had a large part in it. I'll tell you that much. Yeah. Uh, you, you bought some flavor, in my opinion. You bought some flavor to, to the <laughs> series. You did, man. You know, I really enjoyed it. And Brian, I can speak on your behalf as well, man. You, oh, you yeah. I, we had a conversation about that. Yep. Uh, King Cade. Tough. King Cade uh, was originally for a white actor. I couldn't see a no, white actor. No, I cannot see a white guy doing a King no. Cade, man, because... You were tough, man. You mm -hmm. were courageous. Um, you know, you had a little short, you had a short temper too, but <laughs> it, it just it fit. It fit so well. You know, you had a cast too. It was just an incredible cast in Dream Warriors. Uh, yes. you know, of course, Robert England had the lagging camp. A young Lawrence Fishburne, John Saxon, Patricia Arquette. I mean, the list goes on. Could you share any stories from behind the scenes with the cast? I, you know, I know that I give. Um... Chuck Russell, the director, a lot of credit because before we shot the movie, the first day before we shot, he brought us all together for a party, you know, a gathering before. So we all knew. We all knew each other the day we started shooting. And the second scene that we shot was the scene in the room where I went crazy and went out and they had to take me out. Yeah. That was the <laughs> second scene that we shot. And so when we was in that room, we all knew each other and we all had some kinship to each other. So, and I think that's what made that scene really, really work. The fuck you will. Anybody tries drugs on me, get his ass kicked. You just bought yourself a night in the quiet room, mister. Now sit down. Fuck you. You sit down. He's a Kincaid. Nobody gonna put me to sleep. Man, man, get away from me, man. Let that go. Man, I don't want to do this. Ain't nobody gonna put me to sleep. I don't want to go to sleep. Man, ain't nobody gonna put me to sleep. Get your hand. I ain't gonna sleep with nobody. nobody. Stay in your seats. Man, get your hand off me. I don't want to go. The first scene we, that I shot, believe it or not, was the one with uh, Lawrence Fishburne. And my first words that I had to say, yeah. So I don't have to look at your ugly ass all the time. <laughs> that was my first. That was awesome. <laughs> I do it so I don't have to look at your ugly face all the time. Yeah. I mean, you almost sound like that King K guy from Nightmare yeah, you, 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 still, you still got it. I can close my eyes and just picture it. Yeah, that, that was the first words I, that came out of my mouth from Nightmare on the Do you Did you, were you able to keep any, um, like, of your wardrobe or any props from the film? Man, if I could have, I probably would be a rich man right now. But, <laughs> but I, I 
did not. But the one thing that I tried, I was going to do, I was actually going to buy um, the cape from the wizard. And, okay. Uh, Where's your master? Yeah, the, the costume. Because I like those type of stories. And I... I uh, uh, so, wanted, wanted so looking looking back, did you want to be cast as the Wizard Master? Do you play Dungeons and Dragons? I think if they had gave me a choice, I probably would have. Okay, very yeah. If they gave Although, me a choice, I probably would. I, yeah, but you know what though? I could forever see you as Kincaid. He was my favorite character in the film. My favorite character. Um, so speaking of Kincaid, uh, many may not know, especially the younger generation, but you were the first African-American to survive a major horror movie, and they brought you back for the sequel, uh, yeah. Nightmare on Elm Street Part Four: The Dream Master. Now, while it may not be the most popular in the franchise, um, because some people didn't like the fact that they killed off the surviving dream um, warriors. Um, so what are your thoughts on it? Do you think maybe they should have kept one of them to help the new cast? I think they should have kept all of us. Mm -hmm. the new cast. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't a writer, but I, I think, uh, I don't know the reason, but they was hoping that Patricia Arquette was going to come back, but they could not work out a deal. So when they could not work out the deal, um, they want, and at the time, when they was getting ready to do part four, the writers was on a strike. There actually wasn't a script. So when Rodney and I went to meet uh, Rennie Holland, mm -hmm. um, that was just uh, a treatment of it. So um, I understand as a writer what they was doing. Um, they want to get rid of the new, the old, and start with the new. And we mm -hmm. were the old. And they started. I I understand exactly what they was doing. I didn't care for it. I right. wish that could have been. I think if I was writing the script, I think we would have lasted a little longer. Yeah. <laughs> now, when in for your script where they you know killed you in the beginning, was there more to that graveyard scene, or was it pretty much what we saw on screen was on paper? You saw from what I read, it was pretty much on paper. That 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 was what it was pretty much on paper. Okay. And the we, only I, thing with my scenes that changed, and I, I thank God for that, is that Chuck Russell allowed me to do some ad libs. Okay. Because because I was a black uh, actor, I would tell him, as a black actor, I wouldn't say this, you know, and he would say, "Say how you feel," you know, you know, uh, something like that. So. And that's one of the reasons I think Ken Cade was so powerful because his dreams was reachable. Mm -hmm. He just wanted to be strong. He right. didn't want to be the wizard. He didn't want to do all that. His dreams was reachable that anybody could go out there and reach and get. And not only that, he was good with his mouth. He could go head to head with Freddy Krueger with his mouth. He could mm -hmm. play the dub. He could play the dozen, and that's what I was telling Chuck Russell. This black guy could play the dozen just like Freddie. You mm -hmm. know, that's you know he could say he could, his mouth could go just as quick as Freddie. Nobody and stood up to Freddie, and then yeah. that's another reason because we had Heather in the I guess the first one, but that was it. It's like everybody was scared, but you again you stepped up to the plate. Yeah, you you yeah he was you were toe to toe with him. Yep. Yeah, I, I wish the fight scene would have been longer. I do wish that.
did hear, I do not know how true it was, but it seems like it, it makes sense. If you remember at the end of part four, when I die, mm -hmm. I say the words, I'll see you in hell. I'll see you in hell. Tell them sent you. And I had heard that there was rumors that I was going to come back and fight Freddy, that my soul was trapped between Limbo. Ah. And that's why that was there. And I was going to come back and fight him. And you know what, Jimmy? That would have been a great Freddy versus Jason script right there. They're both in hell. Freddy's pounding on Jason. Who comes out from just the shadows? King Cade is like the tag team partner to Jason. And that's as I told you, I'll see you in hell. And then now and King Cade and Jason, yeah, yeah. we got to write it up, write it up, King Cade. Uh, write it up, I'm calling King. I'm sorry. <laughs> write, write it up, Ken. <laughs> you know, oh, you know I, I really would like to see them do a part three. And I think it would be really, really nice. I may try to write the script. So. Uh, I think it would be really, really nice if they did part three, but they show the parents of the kids and it'd be us. It's not off the table. <laughs> it's not. At least nothing's off the table. I mean, hey, well, the um, West Craven estate is uh, looking for new scripts, Ken. So, you know. They are? I didn't know that. Yeah, they're um, they're looking for some new scripts to get some ideas for a new uh, Nightmare on Elm Street movie. Yeah. Wink, wink. There it is. Come on. We, we got to get, so, get something going on over here. Yeah. Uh, I mean, but well, actually, there's a lot going on. I want to, you know, switch gears right now from Nightmare on Elm Street uh, to something that you're writing currently right now. Let's talk about one of the projects. It's a it's a short film. It's called The Secret Weapon. Yesterday is today. Uh, and it was inspired by the 1963 children's protest in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, you know, there's a very important message behind it. Uh, in fact, those events are very similar, Ken, to what's going on today. I mean, you even say yeah. it yourself, too. Um, talk to us about this project and, and what it means to you. Very much so. You know, um, I um, and it's called Yesterday. It's called A Secret Weapon. Yesterday is today. And the reason that yesterday is today is there is because if you look at the pictures from yesterday in 63 and look at the pictures of today, they're the same thing. And so most people do not realize it. In 1963, the civil rights movement was at its lowest. And it was children, some children as young as four years old that went to the streets and gave the power back to the civil rights movement, children. And there was this man this called Bull Connor. Look him up, Bull Connor, B-U-L-L-C-O-N-N-O-R. Bull Connor. He was the most ruthless bigot of the time. He was Freddy Krueger. Wow. And if you want to look at a villain, go back and look at Bull Connor in 1963. He was Bull Connor. So those children, they went head to head with him. Look him up now. Brian. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm doing right now. Yeah. <laughs> look him up. On it. You would hear him say some of the most ruthless things in the world. But how could he get away? Like this, I guess, again, the times, and this is why the movement happened. Like, how can somebody even get away with something like that? Saying things like, you know, yeah. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. 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 Because that was the time. That was the time. Well, you know, look it, at, looking at him, he looks like he could be Freddy Krueger. So. He, he was the Freddy Krueger of the time. Yeah. Yeah. And so I wrote a, a, a short film, which I'm trying to raise the money to do. I need to raise a minimum of, of 60000 to shoot this short film and hope, hopefully parlay it into a feature film. And it's a story about children. This man was so vicious that he, when the jails was full of kids, he put them in the fairground hog pen. Wow. I, I think, think I've seen the five, it was like a five-year-old child um, yeah. when I was watching it. That's it's unbelievable, man. But the fact that, you know, the children actually, they came together and they were the ones that actually pushed the movement forward. The other one is amazing. If it wasn't, the kids gave the momentum back for the walk to Selma with John Lewis and for the um, I Have a Dream speech in Washington. 
and they gave the momentum back for the passage of the 1964 uh, Civil Rights Bill. It was children. And it's the one thing that we haven't written about. Uh, we haven't seen in a narrative. And I want to do that story. And I'm, you know, and so, and for those who don't know, if you, I, I made a special category for the horror family so you could get some wonderful perks. If you go, got them for you, you can get some um, bookmarks. I will nice. sign them. I would sign them. If I were, if you came to a convention, these two things here would cost you close to a hundred dollars. Plus, you get a dog tag, like oh, the one you're yeah. wearing, right? Dog tag, part what? three and part four. Oh, nice. KK, I still got mine right here. Yeah, hey, right there. I told you, <laughs> yeah. I got my dog tag when I yeah. met you over there. And but I, you, what I you didn't picture. have, what you didn't have. You didn't have the wristband because oh, these are I new. I need the wristband. Come on, what else we wristband. got? Wristband. <laughs> The wristband that says Nightmare on Elm Street Part 3 and 4. Freddy's back. <laughs> Freddy's back. Awesome. I heard awesome. the echo. You can you can get all of that. You can get all of that. And I just asked um, if they just go to the SagosCompany.com and buy them. I would sign them and help me reach this sixty thousand dollars. It's reachable. I know it is definitely reachable. We're going to spread the word for you too. And, uh, you know, we also donated, we got, uh, the perk. I forgot the perk that we, that we purchased. Yeah. It was with the, the bag, the book bag. Yes. Stuff like that. So we, we definitely, uh, contributed towards this and we're yes. just spreading the word for you on this as well. I appreciate it. All that you and Brian are doing for me to help me, you know, oh, for sure. I'm going to, gonna, I'm going to, um, I'm on a lot of different film groups on Facebook. So I'm going to share your, your website and, you know, we'll, I'm going to promote this podcast ahead of time, you know, so we can get the word out there earlier than when it will release. Yeah. Because, you know, a lot of people do not believe it's me that's trying to do this, you know, but I've, I've always, and also, um, this year I'm giving out, which is separate from this year, every movie that I've done and every movie that I've written, I've helped put a, a kid through college. Oh. That's what I've done. And so this year I'm giving out 11 scholarships. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Aside from this year. And it's because, you know, I realized, and let me say this to the horror fans. I have to say this. I realized that, you know, you all praise us actors and say all these wonderful things by these actors, but really we will be nothing without you. We're nothing without you. So I, I, I sincerely thank you. And that's why when I go places, I try to be humble and I try to be there and talk to everybody, you know, because I'm who I am because of you. I can say what well, you can say, whatever you want to, you was this, you was this, you had great talent, you had this here. But if you did not like me, it was just been great talent with an ED at the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I want to thank you for that, for that statement. And then uh, the horror fans, I speak on their behalf, I'm sure. And the community, we definitely appreciate you. Uh, nah, for sure. Ken. I mean, you're a stand up guy, Matt. You, you, I mean, you choked me out, but it was great. It was a great experience. <laughs> where was wait I, minute, wait I, I, I missed where, that. <laughs> where my girlfriend at? Uh, somewhere. Somewhere in the, in, the, in the other room over there. She's making something. I smell it. smells good. It smells like okay, garlic. Okay, you know, I have, I have to make sure you treat her right. I like her. 100%. Like her. Okay. 102%. Uh, so you also recently dropped another short film, The McHenry Trial, and that received over 200 awards. 200 and awards. That's like, that. Awards. I've never, I mean, I'm sure, I don't know of any other project offhand that has won so many awards. Um, it's clearly, it's clearly an international short. Now, if I can get to put, <laughs> get the studios or independent money to say that it's going to be a uh, feature film, but yes, it has won over 200 films. I think it won six in Spain. Wow. So um, can you let the listeners uh, know what that film is about? That film is about a 14-year-old kid, brilliant kid, that um, was um, loved at all. And by the time he reached 14, he had went to college and passed the bar. 
and his first case was defended his father who had been accused of murder. And he had to go up against a ruthless young lawyer who was trying to win his 50th in a row case. And this kid went head to head with him. And I try to show the brilliancy of young people in the story so we can watch as a family. And I also got the great Loretta Divine to make a cameo mm. in it. Oh, wow. Nice. I'll send it to you to watch. Oh, please, please, please do. Because mm -hmm. tonight it's, it's- You and Brian, you and Brian. It's awesome. Mr. Thank Ken Sago's night tonight, my man. I'm telling you, <laughs> I'm watching I'm watching that. I'm watching Dream Warriors, uh, yeah, Nightmare on Elm Street 4. And, you know, right now what I want to do, it's a little fun segment here for you, Ken. Uh, right. It's called the two-minute drill. So what we do uh, is I ask you a whole bunch of rapid, random questions, and you just give me the best. Oh, wow. Can't I always answer. get in trouble with these. But, yeah. <laughs> oh, wait. By the way, see trouble. we're not live. So if you need me to edit something, I'll be more than happy to. You ready to go? You got that stopwatch going? I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to All go. right. So maybe you can, when you give us your answers, it could be like in your best Kincaid response. Fucking <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Three, two, one, go. Favorite horror icon? Oh, God. Uh, Alpha just kind of say director. Alpha just Okay. Yeah, it's fine. Favorite slasher? Ready. <laughs> Weapon of choice. <laughs> a gun. I can shoot and run. <laughs> <laughs> to remake or not to remake? Oh, wow. To remake Nightmare 4. Yes. Um, but not remake Nightmare 4 with weak actors. Mm. Love it. Love that answer. Dark Alley in NYC, who has your back? <laughs> NYC, Jimmy. Yeah, you're damn right, Jimmy J does. <laughs> Jimmy, Jimmy. <laughs> until, they, until he see how much money they're going to give him. Oh, man, I don't know about that. Uh, <laughs> because I, <laughs> I wouldn't sell out, no. <laughs> no. Not me, buddy. 80s or 90s horror, King King. Uh, King, King. Wow. 80s or 90s horror, Ken. 80s. That's mm -hmm. it. Uh, favorite horror movie quote? It got to be from my line. Uh, or whatever like whatever you like. Yeah, whatever you like in any movie. Freddy's back. <laughs> Freddy's back! <laughs> Love it. Oh, love it. Best Dude, horror voice. <laughs> I ain't go to sleep. No. Yeah. Best oh, uh, yeah, my dick that's killing me. <laughs> oh, Universal <laughs> monster. You, you wanna know a secret? You yeah. wanna know a secret? What I was saying, that's my dick killing me. Yeah. I couldn't remember my lines and it was written here. And that's why I was saying, oh, oh yeah, it's my dick. <laughs> See when you when you watch it, you go look at that now. And we oh, got yeah, time, but I'm going to add another 20 seconds on it. Yeah, we got to add 20 <laughs> seconds here. Okay, so um, this is probably not even a question here. Favorite Nightmare on Elm Street? Three. That's mm -hmm. it. If you can make any horror movie come to life, which would it be? The Birds. Mm. And is there any uh, horror movie crush that you had? That I had? I have or have? have. I can't tell that because I still know them and they think you're like sisters and brothers. Oh, boy. Uh, um, <laughs> and that's is, time. And that's on that <laughs> note right there. Let's oh, just we almost had the answer. For, stay tuned <laughs> next week. And guess what? Listen, if you go now, Indiegogo. I give support. you a hint. I yep. really told you. But go on. Oh, uh, I already know. Oh, that's it. <laughs> Ken, I have a question for you. Since you have mentioned the birds uh, quite a few times. W if they ever did, would you want to see a remake or would you say, nah, keep it to the original? You remember an old uh, film called Ben back in the day was a black exploitation. It was about this rat. Yes. Yeah. Ben. Yep. I want to write something about a crow. Okay. That was controlling the birds or something like that. So. Oh, okay. uh, I just liked the birds and, you know, when it was done, 
people in it specif- specifically. Mm-hmm. And uh, and because I met Mr. Alfred Hitchcock and because he took a minute and it was just a minute that he took with me, but just to do something in that realm of things, I think he would give homage back to him. And I also think a part of his spirit would be there to help me do a good job. Very nice. So I bet talking with, I mean, you listed a lot of actors and actresses, you know, at the golden age of Hollywood. Like, what was that feeling like talking to these incredible people? Like, what was going through your mind as they're mentoring you? I felt blessed. And, you know, and a lot of times, um, just something very simple. I was walking through the stage one day and that was when Shirley Jones was there and she just looked at me from the mirror when she was at the dressing room and she just said she just smiled and said hello and I got a chance to meet her years later and she said she smiled and I told her about me she said oh yeah you used to come through every day in a, in a uniform, whether you, I thought you was in the movies, but I knew you was going to be in the movies. And, but before we go, I would like to say Joan Rivers mm-hmm. will always be special because she saved my job. Really? Could you tell us that, elaborate on that story? I was working at Universal Studios and I was working at the Black Tower then. Um, that was the big place to work. That's where all the big stars came through. And so I was there and that was at a time when a lot of impersonators was impersonating act, uh, these big actors and trying to get on this lot. And so we was told that if the actor did not have an interview, do not let them upstairs. And Joan Rivers came through and I spoke to her and she said, you have the cutest little Southern accent. And she grabbed my cheeks. And by, by the way, I was so tired of these white women grabbing my cheeks. <laughs> doing this thing. And, you know, and they all say, you look just like Gary Coleman. I, uh. <laughs> anyway, she talked to me about 20 minutes and she went upstairs and the lady found out that she had been down there talking to me. So she thought I had held her up. Mm. And so when Joan Rivers went upstairs, they called and told me I was being released from that post. Wow. So I was packing my things to get for the release person to come and take over. And Joan came through and she said, you hang in there. Okay. And, um, I told her I was sorry if I held her up. And she said, what are you talking about? I explained to her what happened. She did not say a word. She went back upstairs and about five or 10 minutes later, they called me and said I wasn't being taken off that post. And when she came back down there, she said, we told that tramp, didn't we? (laughs) (laughs) And and I wish I knew we was going to talk about this. I will show you the letter that she wrote me one time. Mm. Uh, that she remembered the story and everything. Wow. I, I, I'm going to send it to you, Jamie. I'm going to send yeah, it to you. I'm going to send you a copy that, of that letter. That's incredible. From John that, Rivers, she said, sure, I remember that time. Wow. I mean, you know, it's it's crazy. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, myself, like you meet individuals and you don't know the kind of response you're going to get back from them. Uh, you know, like when I met you, it was incredible, man. Uh, it was a blessing. Um, and a lot of people, some other people, I'm not going to mention names. It wasn't it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. And it was total opposite even so, but like, you know what fans look forward to, uh, to meeting, you know, celebrities, people that are in movies and stuff and all these horror cons and conventions that are going on. That's how, you know, you and I met, um, do you have any experience or stories? I guess you could say from, uh, from the fans interactions with you at these conventions. (laughs) When I first did, this thing, uh, the horror convention, it was actually at Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Oh, yeah, Monster Mania. And Monster Mania. And it was this big, tall, I want to say six foot seven biker came in. And I, I'm going to get in so much trouble. And he came in, he said, You my fucking hero, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Giant telling me I'm his hero. 
And he said, man, he kept saying he called his woman. We drove a motorcycle. We drove 100 miles to see you. And she she wants your autograph, man. Would you autograph? You, you autograph it? And I just said, yeah. I, I, it's what she wants you to autograph. We'll autograph it, right? So I said, yeah. So he went back. He came back with two other bikers. <laughs> and this healthy woman stepped in <laughs> front of him. And they had on these coats, right? And they held these coats up like this here. And she plopped her breast down in front oh of Oh, my him. gosh. And she wanted K-I-N on one side and C-A-I-D on the other <laughs> side with a mark. And I said, like, I can't do that. And then he said, come on, King K, I'll give you $100 a titty. And I said, uh, which side do you want me to <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna get in trouble with that. Y'all gonna that's, that's <laughs> funny. <laughs> Is that a hundred dollars a titty? But we got it. It's well, this one's a li- I don't know. This one looks a little bigger than that one. It might be 125. <laughs> well, you know, if 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 Joey from part three and four was there, he'd be all in it because you know, gets the, the boobs I, get I, him in trouble. I, I, I don't think so. <laughs> the boobs get him in trouble. <laughs> no, they, they wasn't very <laughs> I, I, I don't think so. So I, um, I have, I, but yes, that was my first experience. Wow. Yeah, I believe there was also a lunar eclipse that night. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but there was a, you know, that, it's cool about these conventions. Um, you know, I enjoy going to some of them, and only been a few, uh, but it was, it's an experience. Man. Let me tell you this here the horror community. To my experience, they are the most loyal group of fans anyone could have. Yeah. 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 It's it's nice. I've I've been to like maybe half a dozen conventions and you know, sometimes the lines could be long and you just start talking to one another. I've met a lot of great people and still stay in touch on social media and I have like a little horror family. Yeah, they're very nice and respectable. And so, but I, I have to say that they have been very helpful. So, but also, Jimmy, I need to get a minimum of 300 sales. I'm like at 31 now. You got thir- at 31 for? I, I for need. The, for the film. I, I need, yeah, I need to get at least 300. Oh, we're going to push that. Put, yeah. I'll get a little promo video out there for you too. Oh, for sure. <laughs> Have you seen his promo videos? This no, guy, this guy is a salesman. No. Okay. Yeah. He, 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 he is. is good. He is. He yes. is. He is. He's a salesman. Smooth yeah. operator. Now it's <laughs> yeah. No, but listen, I want to just one thing I want to touch on before we go. I know we excelled. Uh, we exceeded, excuse me, the time. Um, 97, you founded this organization, GBC, the giving back organization. Uh, for those that are unfamiliar, it's an organization that helps, you know, inner city children um, pay for books and supplies for college, college bound students. Very respectable, man. Um, I wish I was one of those <laughs> kids when I was growing up, man. We were struggling, too. Uh, there's so many people struggling, though, nowadays, uh, and it helps. It really helps people stay out of trouble as well. What inspired you to create this corporation? And can you tell the listeners how to contribute, how they can contribute? I, you know, I, I see, I'm just a wealth of stories. I like to tell stories when you remember when you get me all those stories to have to tell. And it, the birth of it um, came from my high school days in Atlanta, Georgia, in the Bluff area of Atlanta. And when I used to go to um, school in the morning, me and my buddies, there was this elderly lady that was. Um, collect you know, going from house to house with a fruit jar begging for money wow. and we used to joke with her she was going from house to house she was asking for money and we called her names we joked with her on the way to school and when we come back from school she would be blocks away still begging for money you know we would still be doing our little thing and then because we were seniors at the time and then when we was going off to college, and the day before I was to go off to college, this lady knocked on my door and the other kids' door, and she gave us money to buy our books. 
Mm. So she was never begging because she was hungry. She was not begging because she needed. She was begging because she said, when these kids go to school, I want to be able to make sure they could buy their books. So the joke was on us. Mm. Wow. And so when I went off to college and I want to come back and thank her, and she died, I think, 10 days before I got back. So I never got a chance to thank her. So each year, I try to give at least 10 little scholarships in honor of her. So mm. that was the beginning of it. And throughout the years, I've had people that God has blessed and put in my life. And so I continue to do that. And I continue to help these youth. And I, because I didn't have during the summer, when I can, I send at least 50 kids to camp because I could not afford to go to camp when I was a kid. I couldn't afford to have my books when I was in college. So I try to make sure that I send a kid to camp and I buy a kid a book. And that's just it. That's, that's amazing. That, that's, that's incredible, Ken, honestly. Um, and I know that she's, she's watching. You got an angel. I believe in that. Yeah. So it, it's, it's a real blessing, honestly, what you're doing out here. Not a lot of people uh, would do that. And um, you're going above and beyond for, for the children. You'll get blessed. I, I, I think I'm blessed because honestly, I know you're going to say this is why, but I meet good people. I meet you. I'm talking to Brian. I meet good people. And at the end of the day, we may not agree if we saw each other every day, but at the end of the day, you know, we have each other. And so, so far, I'm grateful to say that giving back has helped more than 600 kids through college. There are some doctors now. I have adopted mm. a few of them as my son. And as a matter of fact, one of them is about to become a professor at Pepperdine University. What? Oh, wow. And, Congratulations. Yeah, and then there's a doctor, and then there's a lawyer, and there's several social workers. So they're out there, and I, you know, and it's a good feeling. Mm -hmm. It's a good feeling. For sure. Oh, listen, yeah, I appreciate so those kind words, Ken. I mean, listen, I'm going to agree with you either way when I see you. I don't want to get choked again. <laughs> so <laughs> it's just not. <laughs> no, but it, it really is. I always preach this. Teamwork makes the dream work, man. Uh, you know, there's, yeah. there's so many negative people out here and so many people doing so much like negative. Uh, we need more positive. And this is positive right here. And I, you don't know how much I appreciate it. Just li just listening and looking at what you're writing and what you're doing out here. Uh, it's incredible, man. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But I, I, what all we do is it's an extension of who we are to other people. And so I believe that. I, I believe that no matter how hard things get for me, I am going to still give back by helping someone's child to get an education. Because there's something you can't take from anyone. You can take oh. any physical thing. But you cannot take knowledge from a person. And knowledge is power, Ken. Yes. yes. And that's last question here. Okay. Advice. Speak about knowledge. What advice? Ken Sagos 2021. Give Ken Sagos 1985. Don't give up. A man without a dream before he goes to bed has no reason to wake up in the morning. Mm. So dream. Let's hope it's not a nightmare with Freddy Krueger. Uh, and, and if it is one, you better have Ken Kate on your side, man, because he's yeah. down there right now fighting Freddy Krueger. Ken, thank you so yeah. much for taking the time out to talk with us. Uh, we appreciate everything you do on the screen and, of course, off the screen. Folks, Ken Say goes, King Kate, the man. Thank of you. A thousand hats. If you're able to support his upcoming short film, please do so. The secret weapon yesterday is today. Please do. Thank you for viewing and thank you for celebrating horror, not only in October. 365. Get Brian, it, love you. Love, love you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Let's go kick the motherfuckers ass all over dreamland.